Hi everyone, it's Nina Collins from The Wolfer. Um, I'm here today for a book talk with author Catherine Raven, whose first book, a memoir called Fox and I, An Uncommon Friendship, has just come out, published by Spiegel and Grau. Just came out, I think, the first week in July. And Kathy, we're so glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, full disclosure, I guess one should do these things. I'm on the board, actually, of Spiegel and Grau, the publishing house. Oh, wow. Kathy's book. So just so everyone knows, I'm an old friend of um, your publisher, your editor, Cindy Spiegel, and of Julie Grau. I respect them both tremendously. Um, Me too. I'm very excited that this is their first book and, and yours. So thank you again very much. Um, so everyone, Kathy, this is a very unusual kind of book. Um, there's a quote on the cover from Jan Martel, the author of Life of Pi. I would say it's a great book for readers who loved H's for Hawk, which is another literary um, memoir of, of set in the world of animals and nature. Um, this is a book about, so Kathy is a PhD biologist. She has had a long career as a park ranger. She lives out in big sky country in Montana um, and works a lot leading field groups in Yellowstone. Um, so, and this is the story of her relationship that developed with a fox um, who ultimately became her best friend. And it's a very kind of beautifully written, um, personal story of a woman that there's a lot around kind of nature and solitude and um, these really interesting questions about anthropomorphization of animals that I want to talk about. Um, so anyway, that's the book we're here to discuss. Welcome. So I think my first question for you, Kathy, this is a funny one. I don't, I know you're doing a ton of interviews. The book is getting wonderfully reviewed everywhere. So Thank I you. I'm leaning towards my microphone. Um, there's a quote where you say later in the book, I was always alone trying to disappear. And I'd love you to talk to us a little bit about that. I have known probably since I was 14 that I didn't have a home. I had a, a house. I never felt like I was going to be out in the rain or snow and freeze to death. I always had a structure and food. That wasn't the worry, but people forget that a home and a house are two different things. If you pay attention to animals, you know that though. A home is something internal that you take with you. And I didn't feel like I had that. And I have a, I like to explain things in, in anecdotes and stories and images and maybe because I've been teaching students for so long, but it's funny, this is a story that hadn't come to my mind before, but since you asked, you're the first person that's asked about that. When I went to American University, I was odd, I suppose. I mean, the, the counselor was concerned. I was so much younger than everybody else for one thing, and it was totally the wrong place for me to be, which is another story. But I went, the Dean of Students sat me down when I started and she was looking through these files and I don't know what she was looking at because I couldn't see them, but she was going through my files and she said, I have to tell you a story. I come from a loving family. I have a husband and children. They've supported me for decades. There's never been a question in my mind that I came from a loving home even before I was married. So I've always been in a loving home and I've never been alone. And now I have cancer and I'm dying. Mm. And I want you to know that at some point in everyone's life, she said, for me, it's now I'm dying. And no matter how much love and how much support I have, I am alone. Mm. So you have to realize that you're just finding it out Early. sooner. And I have no idea what she knew about me, what she was reading in those my, the high school counselor obviously said something there. There was a lot of background going on to get me into a college. It was the only college my high school counselor could get me into in the whole United States. Everybody was concerned about admitting somebody who was young. It was a problem. No evidence. Right, you were very young. I was very young and there was no evidence that I was mature for my age. And I was going to be like three years younger than most people in the dormitories. Big problem. And the second problem was I had no, she was trying to get me admitted before I even finished my junior year so that I could go right away immediately after my junior year ended. So I had no, she was expecting people to accept me with no high school degree, no GED, nothing, just like my, and she was able to 
talk, this one school, one other school almost accepted me, but uh, they wanted that. They wanted a degree, a GED or something, and we just couldn't pull it off. So Kathy, it, it I, was the only place. I relate to what you're saying in a lot of ways. It's funny. I also left, left high school after junior year and did not ever get a high school diploma. Um, I went to Barnard. To- I totally understand. Um, But also you're talking about being alone. I mean, my mother died when I was young, so we had different traumatic childhoods, but I've always felt very aware that like ultimately we're always alone, right? And coming to terms with that has been a real um, maturation point for me, I think. Not being afraid of that, which is how I spent a lot of my earlier adult life and kind of coming to terms with it has been helpful. So that's really interesting. Thank it you. It is helpful, don't you? I mean, because eventually, so you and I just learned it earlier. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I learned it earlier, just like you. Um, so my next question is, I mean, obviously as a, with your scientific training and your professional life as a ranger, right? You've been taught to not anthropomorphize animals. I know this is a question you've gotten a lot, but it is really sure. interesting. Right. So you were used to avoiding the humanizing wild animals. You spend all this time in the natural parks. You eat meat. You're pro hunting, as far as I understand, or you know, for eating. You don't like cats, or at least you don't like cats. <laughs> not the wild ones. In your book. So I'm curious then, how do you go from those stances to saying my best friend is a fox, which is something you definitely say in the book. And then I do want you to, I'd love for you to tell our listeners how this relationship with Fox started. But how do you, how do you make sense of this? Um, Cause I, I come from a family, I have a family of animal fanatics. My ex-husband, we had like 16 domestic animals when we were together and my kids have four dogs and so I'm, I'm constantly dealing. In fact, we just had a puppy. My kids are grown, thank God. Um, but we, one of my kids' puppies just killed another child, Bunny, while they were on vacation. I'm glad you put the word bunny in there. There was a pause when yes. you said another child. But it was horrible. They killed, she killed Ella's dog killed Violet's bunny by mistake. They were having a family vacation this summer. So there's a lot of a lot of loving animals that goes on in my family. And I think about these issues a lot of like, how do you see an individual in an animal? Like we see individuals as people, but how do we see them as animals? And anyway, so how do you deal with these questions? It was a slow process and I fought it for a long time because I wanted to stick to really the the straight skinny that I had been trained that I believed in not anthropomorphizing animals from both my park service training and from academic training. So a slow process, it just became unavoidable for me to see that that fox had a personality Mm -hmm. from observing him and from comparing him to other foxes on my property as well as comparing him to the science that I had read and realizing that the science is telling us about foxes, just like information about humans tells us about humans, but it doesn't tell us about all the outliers. It's just the average. So that helped. And something else that you're approaching that's so interesting when you talk about the hating the cats and the killing, and there's a way to love animals, I suppose, and be a better human than I am. <laughs> be, be an absolute, sep- it's almost the same thing as anthropomorphism, only it's reverse anthropomorphism. So you're still separating humans from animals. It, somewhere early in the book, I say that I felt that our culture is afraid of anthropomorphism because we're afraid of seeing animals with human traits, but more so, and this is what you're getting at, more so we're afraid of seeing humans Uh, with animal traits. And so I went right past that anthropomorphism, accepted it, and then saw myself as closer to Fox. So I'm not above him. I'm not one of those perfect, pure humans. I hope Cindy's not listening like vegans. And okay, vegans are better than me. I'm not going to deny it. They're more perfect humans, but I'm not Mother Teresa. So I'm not a higher form of life than Fox really necessarily. So I do the sa- I have the same foibles that he has. And so I'm afraid of things and hate things too, like feral cats. Uh-huh. I can't put myself in this great position and say, I'm a human. I'm not 
an animal. And so I'm not going to wear leather shoes and all that because I'm just not, I'm just like him. I hunt just like him. And so I'm, yeah. And that's a really, that's just awesome what you brought up, but that's the problem. Like I'm like him. He's not like me. (laughs) There are so many things that are really interesting in there. I mean, for one thing, it's making me think, I mean, of course your relationship with Fox was because it was this Fox. It was this Fox who you developed a friendship with, but also the idea that humans are afraid of facing how much we're like animals is is a really interesting thing too, that I don't think we look at enough. Um, So tell us how you met Fox. How did this friendship happen? The point at which there was no going back. And this is something very important, I think that you'll get from the book. Eyes are really, really important. Mm -hmm. I judge the world and hopefully you do too, but maybe you have other ways of, maybe you have more experience and maybe people have other ways of imagining what people's personalities are like, but you have to have a way of knowing who your friends are and who your enemies are when you step into a group. You can imagine, looking down, say, at the Lamar Valley in Yellowstone, there's the cranes and there's the buffalo and there's the antelope. There's a coyote running through and there's a bear and there's all of them in this relatively small area using the same resources. And they have to be able to navigate by knowing, by having some sense. And so eyes of of who the enemies are and who's not the enemies. And so I have to, I judge that using my eyes and Fox and I came eye to eye in such a poignant moment that there was no turning back. And it's very difficult to have a moment like that with a, with a wild animal. Yeah. I had a scab on my knee and I was just so focused on this enormous house fly that was sucking on that blood. And when I looked up from that fly, <laughs> the fox was like this far away and he wasn't even looking at me. He was only laser focused on that fly. It was this big fly on my knee. And I stared at him. Sorry to interrupt you, but just for our listeners, for the setting, you were at your home, which was a cabin you had built in Wyoming, in Montana. But it's a stone throw from Wyoming. Yeah. Well, if you have a good throwing arm anyway. Wow. So you were living there alone and you were outside and you were looking at this fly and suddenly you looked up and there was a fox, right? And there, there was a fox. Was and I, I was astounded. And I, I just said, fox. And he finally looked up at me and then I'll, and then I'll never forget that it, he turns his nose down, his snout down because otherwise it would have sort of blocked our, and when he did that, our eyes were almost the exact same width. And I was sitting on wooden steps which are now cement because of fire danger. If any of you have wooden steps and you live in, in the West, you might think about turning them into cement right about now. Mm-hmm. Um, we were the same height above the ground. Our eyes were the same height and the same width. And we were just directly eye to eye. And I could have just reached out and strangled him. And he could have reached out and swatted me across my face with those big claws. And so we had this amount of trust and we just kept staring into each other's eyes. And he stayed there while I, all I said was Fox, but I, I just kept saying Fox, Fox. And he knew that I wasn't, he could tell by the tone of my voice and my eyes that I recognized him and that I wasn't a foe and that I was friendly. Now, after that, we were just locked in. I mean, after that, I, I tried to reverse what, what was inevitable for a long time, but I couldn't, then we were on the way to be, there's so few times when, when you lock eyes with a human like that. Yeah. And you connect like that. It's and you connect like that. And so that was just really astounding. It's like going on an, the rare online date where you actually connect with someone and you feel like this makes sense. It's pretty, it's very rare. And so I'm sure that first meeting, I mean, I've read the book, but I'm asking questions so people can understand. I mean, it must have taken a while. You got into a routine where Fox was showing up every day at the same time and you would travel and worry about him and knew where he lived. I mean, you really did develop this extraordinary relationship. What led you to starting to write the book? I mean, I assume you'd only done academic writing before that? Yes, that's right. So, I mean, everybody who's been to college writes and everyone with a doctorate degree writes, but yes, of course, I hadn't done any type of uh, creative writing or liter- literary writing. Well, it was an astounding moment when I realized how much I owed this animal. And it 
it might be something that you would call love, but love is a word that I use colloquially, casually, you know, like I love that food or that lunch or my shoes or something like that. But it's, it's not a word that means something to me in terms of a relationship really, but something that did mean something to me is this amount of trust that I had never experienced before. He brought his second batch of kits, the little uh, baby foxes are kits, four of them down to my house in the, in the, it was night, but it wasn't dark. It was nearly a full moon. It was around 1 a.m. He brought them down to me and they were bouncing and jumping all around me and he let them. He didn't Mm -hmm. swat them back or try to protect them from me. And then he went and sat and just paid no attention and let me babysit his kids. Mm -hmm. And that amount of like, he was introducing them to me to say, this girl is okay. She's one of the good ones. We're not afraid of her. And he just let me babysit them. There was this draw near by the front of my house and the draw has a weasel in it. And, um, a, a weasel will easily kill a kit, but he, he didn't, there's lots of things around like feral cats. <laughs> yeah. And he just trusted me that much. It was the most astounding thing. I had, I couldn't believe it. So if you want to say, well, can you see a tangible evidence of what somebody might call love? To me, that was it. Mm-hmm. And I felt like that's, that's how cool. this animal feels about me. Yeah. That crazy. And that night I knew for sure somehow I was going to tell his story because he had just given me so much Uh, knowing how he felt about me, made me feel like I was on my path to having a home, a place feeling like I had some self-esteem. I mean, this animal loves me. He trusts me that much. Yeah. It was just astounding really. So that was when I decided to write his story. Fascinating. Guys who are listening, we're, we're talking about a book called Fox and I, An Uncommon Friendship that's just come out by Catherine Raven. Um, so I'm curious, this experience, I don't want to spoil for readers how the book ends and what happens to Fox, but um, do you think you'll have another experience like this in your lifetime? Has this changed how you feel about domestic animals? Do it have- might. Um, I don't have anything against domestic animals. I mean, obviously, any way that you can, there's a shortage of all animals in the world, except for humans. <laughs> there's not a shortage of humans, and there's a shortage of pretty much of everything else. So if you can make room in your home for an animal, you might live in a place where you can't hang out with wild animals, then keep a domestic, you know, keep one inside because animals just need, you know, you, whatever you can do. I would like to, and it's hard, the things that you, I think you have to have, some, some very odd things have to happen. I almost, almost certainly it, it needs to be a male. And there's some really, really good evidence that doesn't involve foxes, that involves humans. But the scientific community has very good evidence as to a genetic component that's tied to the Y chromosome. That, and I suspected that with fox as well, that yeah. males... Make take more risks than females do. Every time I almost have a connection with deer, it is always a male. I have a a male poodle that I got this year, and everyone said male poodles are better. Um, hmm, That's interesting. They're more willing to take risks than females are more cautious, and so a male. And then the weird thing is they have to be diurnal. And so many animals have lived around humans for so long that they're nocturnal because they're afraid of us. And you can't really have a relationship that, that builds in the nighttime. Right. So they have to be that. And they have to have a pattern. They have to be willing to keep up that pattern because even someone like me who's working at home and has a pretty flexible schedule, you can't be outside 24 hours a day waiting. That animal had this exact schedule. It was based, I'm pretty sure, on the sunlight coming down past this. Soon as he saw that west sun, because it's really bright, soon as it gets behind that hill, then it creates the shade right at my house where he wants to be. And he was there right then. But he had a regular schedule. I had a, there is a skunk on my property that's been here for a long time. And I thought the problem with the skunk, which is very 
which is enjoyable to watch and I'm very attached to and has a lot of unusual characteristics, although it's female Mm -hmm. and it is diurnal, which is really interesting. The problem with skunks are that they're too small and you, you, even when it comes really close to me, we can't, we will never see eye to eye. It's little eyes are just too close together. And I know it's not afraid of me, but there's never going to be that connection. So you have to have an animal that's the right size. But that's it limits. Thing. So you really, I mean, it makes sense, but you really, difficult. the visual connection, the eye to eye connection is crucial to, con- mm-hmm. to, to. Yeah. Like owls, for example, it's easy to have connections with owls compared to other birds because they don't have the beak in the front that blocks their eyesight. So you are actually able to see eye to eye with some of the larger owls. Right. And do you ever, have you ever had cats or dogs? Like, do you want to have an animal living in your house? No, I mean, of course, like all kids um, who have parents that don't like pets, like all kids, you're always whining for the pet, the pet, the pet, but it's not up to you. And then I was always just having a life that was just so, you know, just moving around. I didn't really have a permanent home base, even a permanent structure to have a pet. If I had stayed here or moved to a city instead of, you know, meeting the fox and deciding to stay here and have wildlife for my best friends, I I almost certainly would have gotten a a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Some animal. But now I can't because now I realize that it's a problem for wildlife. And now I have so much opportunity. Yeah, I wouldn't have a skunk living here and coming by right on my steps all the time if there was a dog around. Yeah, Yeah, they they won't tolerate that. That's interesting. So it's a choice and and you want it's a choice. Yeah. Yeah. So my, this is so fascinating. I just, and, and for everyone, Fox and I is a super interesting book about Catherine Raven's um, friendship relationship with a fox who approached her and her property and they developed this relationship. I'm curious going much further back, like your writing about nature is so beautiful. Where did you grow up? I consider that I grew up in California, but before I, and I have pretty good memories of of California, actually, the house that I grew up in, I remember in amazing detail, everything about it. And yes, and I went back with the friend and checked it on Zillow and I was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't remember the name of the city, but I remember the street address and every tree, the grass, the in the front, the details. And yet the place I was living in that I really needed to get away from to get into college, I remember nothing about it except that it was brick. (laughs) Very, I mean, just, yeah. So that's, um, so I, I do consider, I think the first seven years of your life maybe is where you think of yourself as growing up. But I know from reading memoirs, so many people have memories of the first three years. And I, yeah, well, I think, I mean, I certainly can remember childhood home really vividly too those things really imprint but did you have a love of nature always is that something I like- had to be outdoors always 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 yeah 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 the good thing about California is there's lots of animals out. there's there's lizards outside and tortoises yeah. and um there's so lots of animals a lifelong animal lover and nature watcher nature always of- yeah always the outdoors and always nature and I knew that I um when my high school Uh, guidance counselor was trying to help me find a way to get out of um, high school and get into college. She said, have you changed your mind? Because, you you know, you said you wanted to be a vet or going to, and I said, no, I mean, I had never. So yeah, it's weird that I went to a college at first, originally after my junior year that had no zoology program, no vet program, not even, I mean, nothing. It was just like massively inappropriate, but, but it it, still, I got to live in the dorms and that was cool. (laughs) So your next book will be, or is it too soon to ask? I love working on my next book because I love the characters. Oh, and, and the protagonist actually is from uh, Southern California. She's a gal on the uh, autism spectrum and she's escaping to Canada as the book starts. And she's in her early twenties and uh, there's four characters, but she's the protagonist, the main one. It's in third person. It's called the owls of Sybil Springs. And oh. the girl of course is in love with owls in the Pacific. What North a beautiful Coast. title. And it's a novel. That's so exciting. For it's you. a novel and I love it. And I love the characters in it. Oh, yeah. That's great. Well, we've chosen your book as I believe our August book club pick. So. Yeah. Thank you so much. You guys are great.
We're all going to be reading Fox and I, An Uncommon Friendship by Catherine Raven, really an unusual, unique, beautifully written book by a woman in our demographic. Our community is for women over 40. Um, and we have lots and lots of big readers. So I'm very pleased to be telling them all about you and your book. And um, I just wish you luck. I think it's, it's, it's published to a great success already, and I'm sure it will just continue wow. to grow. Um, I'm very happy for you. And thank you for taking some time to be with us. Thank you.